Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions – Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love Group and is part of the Education in Love series. In the How I Feel About Love Q&A presentation, Jesus answers questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation How I Feel About Love. Recorded on the 5th of March 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Da, da, da. Spanish guitar, classic guitar, lovely. I, I know some people that it totally drives bonkers when you play the <laughs> Spanish guitar. I find that so strange. Okay, so this session we're going to be discussing the subject, how I feel about love, Q&A. So this is your opportunity to engage some questions about what we've discussed already in the first two talks we've given this morning. Does that make sense? So fire away, guys. If we, um, so who's got our mics? You're Graham and, uh, what's your name again? Diane, that's right. So uh, if we, Graham, if you come down to Karen, and Diane, if you come across to Pat. Thanks. Far away, Karen. Um, my, my, my life shows me that I'm very afraid of uh, punishing God. Yep. Um, just recently I kind of uh, got that, I, I, I kind of, Came came to this idea that, uh, and it felt like a truth that um, my desperate desire to have a, a kind and loving God is actually just in my mind. Yes, yeah. It's a hope. It's a hope more than reality. Well, it, it's kind of messed up my praying because I'm thinking. I agree. I don't know if there are spirits saying there's no point praying to that God because you don't believe in it. Exactly. Uh, um, and can I don't know what to do about prayer now. Okay, well let's let's examine the emotion. Is you feel, believe in a punishing God, yeah. right? So so there's the emotion. Now now we we talked about God. The, the this is the, where we want to aim for initially, isn't it? Blank slate is really what we want. And you believe that God's a punishing God. So the question becomes, where did this belief come from? Now, has God personally punished you? If you keep the mic with you. No. No. So you've never had an experience where God goes, <laughs> bolt of lighting. <laughs> and by, I, I suggest to you, actually, if God decided to punish you, then perhaps the punishment would be quite extreme as well. So you'd definitely notice it, right? So God's never decided to punish you. You've never experienced personal punishment from God. So, and yet you believe in a punishing God. So, so the then question has to be asked, where did this emotional belief come from, doesn't it? Because it can't, it can't be with God because it's not been a personal thing with God. So where does it come from? Where do you think it comes from? From what you're saying, like it has to come from when I was a child. Or my, yes. I sometimes Ooh. think it was the way my parents were treated and it came through to Correct, me. correct. So it's got to have come through your childhood experience somehow emotionally, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Either, either from the fact that your parents were treated that way about God yeah. and, and, and therefore had it in their heart and soul by the time you were conceived, you then would have absorbed it and therefore you have the same feeling inside of yourself. So, so can you see that this is an important association to make? See, the problem is, is that you've actually felt it as towards God rather than actually seeing it as something that came from your parents' feelings. You follow? Y yeah, I've seen that intellectually but I've never felt that and yeah, well, this is the reason why focusing on this towards God is not releasing emotionally anything. Because, it, because it's actually not a belief you have that is your personal experience. You follow? Yes. Yeah. And it's the personal experience type of associations emotionally that we need to release. So right from the time of, of conception right the way through. It's the personal experiences that we can only release. We can't release something that wasn't a personal experience, basically, is yeah. what I'm suggesting to you. So, so, so you have two options here. One is to actually talk, start talking to God about God 
about your belief and knowing that it's false. Okay. Do you follow me? Yeah. Because of, and knowing that God's never treated you that way, and what you would like to have demonstrated from God is a is a contrast, isn't it? Wouldn't, yep. you, wouldn't you like that? Like, wouldn't you like God to like? So, if this is the viewpoint of God, I'll just rub this out up to there, just so that I've got more bite, what, what, what to write on. So, at this stage, you don't know what God really feels about you. That's really, yeah. that's that's how it really is. You believe He's going to do that to you. Yeah. Right. If you get something wrong or do something wrong, yeah. in particular, you believe that's going to happen, and and that has to have come from a number of different sources, does it not? Yes. So, what are those sources potentially? Intellectually, let's go through the operation. What are those sources that they could have come from? That belief. Well, the one, the one I can most identify with is the way my mother, my mother's beliefs about God. Right. So, so. Can you see one of the things you're going to have to process is that is your desire, oh, i.e. F's, isn't it? Um, you're going to have to process your desire to accept your mother's beliefs. Okay. Does that make sense? You have a desire to accept her beliefs. Because I'm afraid of disagreeing with her. Yeah, why? Um. Why is anybody afraid of disagreeing with anybody? <laughs> Yeah, well, we afraid of punishment or disapproval and not acceptance and quite yeah. a number of things. Yeah, gets a bit vague for me there, but yeah. Well, this is the thing: is that there must have been something happened in your childhood where you become so afraid of disassociating your beliefs from your mother's that now you have a desperate need to believe things that your mother's mother believes, even though you don't necessarily, even intellectually, accept that they can be logically true. So, so do I have to identify what that was? Or? You have to work out the emotions you feel about why you want to accept your mother's and father's beliefs. Okay. Does that make sense? What, what, yeah. are, you, what are you afraid of with them? Right. Yeah. Is what you're going to have to look at. Okay. Because you're afraid of disassociating from their belief systems. Yeah. Otherwise you would have already done it, right? Because yeah. you've heard, uh, over your life, you, you think you've been a Catholic, you've learnt a lot about God, some of it's been good, some of it hasn't been that good, but some of it's been good. And since the last seven or eight years, you've been listening to God's truth, and, and yet that you haven't been able to absorb that. So there's got to be something present, preventing you from absorbing that truth. Well, there's, there's such a strong thing that for as long as I can remember, God was loving and good, and, and just to suddenly realised recently that it was just in my head, you know? Correct. There's a difference between what you've been told, yeah, right, and what the feelings are. Yeah. And, the, and this is why what you're told is of very little importance in your progress, right? Yeah. It's your feelings that matter more. So, so you've been told a whole things about God. In fact, if anything, you've been told what to believe about God without actually knowing that God's like that. Yes. It's almost like, and, and this is what the faiths like the Catholic faith and other faiths do, whether it be Muslim faith, Catholic faith, Hindu faith, whatever faiths we have on the planet. Because we've grown up the, from, with them, and if you think about it from a doctor's point perspective, from the moment of conception, you're absorbing people who emotionally have belief systems attached to certain faiths, and in your case, the Catholic faith. And, and you're absorbing their belief systems because it's the only way to maintain survival with those particular people. If yeah. you disagree with them, mum and dad, if you disagree with mum and dad on that matter, and in your case it's your mother who had a more firm, firm belief. Yeah, she was a very devout one. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and if you disagree with her on these subjects, then you're now in disharmony with her. If yep. you're in disharmony with her, you're, as a child, your very survival is threatened, actually. Um, and, and it's highly likely being in disharmony with her also carries the threat of punishment. You follow? Hence the belief... Yeah, I, d I just don't get the form of punishment my mother would give me because like, she's so sorry for herself all the time. It's like, yeah, I, but I'll, I'll ponder on that one. But this is where you need to use your will to find, feel more about the situation with right. your mum. Because the reality is your mother has some very, very violent tendencies yeah. and I can feel her from the spirit world. She's still got violent tendencies about certain subjects and she's militant about the Catholic faith. 
Yeah, she's, a, she's very demented, but I imagine she's mostly in the... Not, yeah. yeah, she is. Mostly in the spirit world, right? She's, oh, she's still alive, yes. but, but she's like lost her yes. mind, basically, yes. and, and, and in a quite emotional state, and very, very militant about, the, about her faith, you know? Yeah, I get it. It's, it's the only thing that keeps her functioning in her mind, you know? Yeah. Yep. So in her sp in her spirit form, which she's in now pr predominantly, because yeah. because she's not present in her body and hardly in at all, yeah. in her spirit form, she 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 is very very frightened and concerned, and her Catholic faith is the only thing keeping her in her in her current state. In fact, if she abandoned that, she she believes at this stage that she might have to abandon everything, and that would be a disaster for her. Well, it was a big thing in her life, bigger than us, you know. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I feel it's quite clear why you have these beliefs. Okay. The key, the key for you, is to start is to start letting yourself feel your mother's true feelings. If you had confronted her beliefs about God and her beliefs about her faith, okay. you follow. And that's where what you're scared of. That's what you're scared of doing. Yeah. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. she will, she will have quite a strong violent reaction to it. She's already had strong violent reactions to it in the past. Well, it was one of the big factors that led me to having an abortion. I didn't want her to know that I, you know, was yeah. pregnant. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The the fear of her her feelings about your pregnancy was strong enough to cause you to an abort abortion. the child. Even that's how how afraid of her you are. Yeah. Right, and you need to like, start acknowledging that that level of fear exists for a reason. Right. Do you understand? Like you, you, at this stage, you almost believe that it's a figment of your imagination that you needed to be that afraid of her. I'm saying to you, no. A child who's that afraid of their parents is afraid of that parent for a reason. You follow? Yep. Yeah, and uh, and and the stuff that comes from your mother, yep, there's a lot of potential violence there. Okay. Yeah, so there's a reason. Thank you. you saw that? Yeah, thanks. Yep. If we come over to... Yep. I was wondering from God's perspective, is worth, is there anything about worth, is it, or is it meaningless from God's perspective? When you say meaningless, God knows that, uh, God knows that the biggest problem on the planet is a lack of worth, <laughs> basically, in all people. Of course, from God's perspective, we don't need to have a lack of worth because from God's perspective we're all like the pinnacle of his creation. Like he, he, he sort of looks upon you and goes, you're a marvel of my ability, <laughs> is how he sees you. So, so he, he, you know, he, he's, he's and, and not only that, he, he, he loves the fact that he's created each of you as individuals, individual personalities and so forth, and he, he wants to know you and experience you. Which he does to a degree, but you prevent a lot of it from happening. So, so from God's perspective, um, you already have worth. It's just your emotional belief that you don't, which is the biggest problem. So there is, it isn't about becoming more loving. It isn't, there isn't, we, I already am as worthy as I will ever be. From God's perspective, yes. From God's perspective. But not from yours. Not from Got it. Yeah. Not from yours. And why is that? Because again, family of origin impose these beliefs upon you. So, so stop blaming God for your lack of worth and allow yourself to see where your lack of worth came from, which always happens in our childhood. It's not anything to do with God. Yep. Yep. And it's a big problem with the multi what I'd classify as multi-generational sin. Now remember, sin is out of harmony with love. So, so multi-generational pass down of emotions out of harmony with love like worth is a huge one, personal lack of personal worth. And, and what we do to get some worth is scary, honestly. Like many of you have engaged sexually with people who you hardly even know just to get some worth. Many of you have done things, e even, like, uh, even like abortions like Karen just mentioned, in order to prevent yourself from having your worth attacked. Right, so, so a lot of that is about worth as well. There's so many, we're, we're willing to murder and, and call it okay for the sake of worth. We're willing to go to extremes 
for the sake of worth. This is our big problem. So, so yeah, it is a large problem, but, but understand that from God's perspective, God, you're already perfectly worthy. And so, yes, you could say from God's perspective, worth is not really an issue, but God knows that the issue is within us that we need to work our way through. Yep. Thank you. Jennifer, if you just go straight. Um, a couple of weeks ago, on, I had a... Are we focusing off. on questions yes. about how you feel about love? I think or so. God? I think so, Okay, yes. far yep. away. Um, my C- can you avoid the story, though? Yep. yep. And try. be more specific? Thank you. I found out that I didn't believe I was God's daughter yep. because my parents wanted a son so much that I didn't even relate to being a daughter. Yeah. Um, and that really shocked me. Yeah. Um, but when I realised, I just I was elated, and I felt like it was an opening for me, another opening for me to get closer to God because I my identity. I feel like my identity. I have to work on my can, own identity. Can I suggest something to you though? And I see a lot of you getting mixed up in this process. You're mixing up the process of uh, knowing God and knowing yourself. So on one hand, you've got um, yourself, knowing yourself. And then on the other hand, you've got knowing God. And to me, what you just talked about was the thing about knowing yourself. Okay. Is it not? Yes, it yes. is. Yeah. So, so, so what I'm suggesting to you is that many of you have become addicted to knowing yourself. In fact, many of you have been drawn to the divine love path, as you call it. I call it the way, but you call it the divine love path. Many of you have been drawn to that path because you feel it's a vehicle to help you come to know yourself better. I sort of see that as a fairly narcissistic approach. Because I feel that the more I know God, the more I feel from God, the more I'll know myself better anyway. Like knowing myself is a subsequent result of my connection with God. Not, and in fact, there's a whole heap of things about yourself you've got no knowledge of unless God tells you right, what your abilities are, what your concepts are, what your, your future life could be, and a lot of other things, all of which are a part of you being your real self. Most of you have no knowledge of because you're not letting God tell you those things. So don't get mixed up in this knowing self, knowing God thing. The reality is if you come to know God first, then knowing self is an automatic subsequent result. You follow me? Yes. But a lot of what what each of you are doing is you're rubbing out this knowing God thing and then you're trying to know yourself. And I'm saying to you, well, you will never know everything about yourself if you do that, ever. There's, there's people in the sixth dimension in the spirit world who have been there tens of thousands of years and they still don't know things about themselves because they're not hearing God tell them about themselves. Okay. Do you follow me? Yeah, it makes so, a lot of sense. So it's much more reliable, to dis- in terms of a process of self-discovery, it's far, far more reliable first to know God and then through that relationship, discover yourself, know yourself. You follow me? Yes, I do. Much okay. more reliable. Mm-hmm. So you to be careful about this, uh, you know, this desire to know yourself but ignore God. And Because I'm basically saying to you right now that if you do that, you will never know yourself completely. Ever. Ever. Okay, thank you. Right. So if we go to, to Ivana and then right up the back to Jen, is it? Jennifer, is it? Uh, jo- Joanne, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I've been doing exactly what you said. Yep. Uh, projecting my feelings towards my pr- parents onto God. Yep. Um, so are you saying that I, just through my use of my will, I can just stop doing that right now? Mm-hmm. You can. And just... Uh, so just completely stop. Do it You've like got to find the to reason why you did it. Yep. Emotionally. There's an emotional reason why you do it. So let's look at the issue. You've got here on the one hand, you've got all of these things. Let's call this your so-called feelings. And I'll put it in quotes, just you know, so you know it's not necessarily your real feelings towards God.
And then we have our reasons for doing that. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then we have underneath that what we have avoided doing that. You follow? Now, can you see these feelings towards God are basically imaginary? Well, yeah, they're just what I feel towards my parents. Yeah, but you're, you're making that presumption because it might not just be your parents, it might be what happened at school, it might be what happened with older siblings and so forth. It's all family of origin stuff or, or you could say your childhood stuff. Yeah. You, at this stage you're making some assumptions about what that is. Okay. right? But, but you can see though that if I discover my reasons for doing that, which are emotional, so remember these are emotional are emotions that I'm going to have to feel, right? If I can discover those reasons and, 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 and work through them, what becomes plain to me then is... Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> I didn't realise you were asking me. Um, yeah, all the pain that I have avoided. That you've chosen to avoid yeah. through that process. Yeah. So, so the very first thing you're going to have to do is look at the reasons why you've done that. Okay, so I won't just be able to... You won't be able to just get to just the emotions to, themselves yeah. without first processing through the emotional reasons why you've decided to blame God rather than associate that with it. And there's reasons. like, And a lot of that is to do with that. If I actually put the um, responsibility of these emotions on my parents, highly likely I'll probably get even worse treatment from my parents. Yeah. And, that, and then we go, well... No, that's not a good thing. I want better treatment from my parents. And so we avoid the processing of the reasons. Does yeah, well, this is something I've just been thinking about lately because I was re-watching some stuff from the previous, uh, the 2014 assistance group. Yep. And, yeah, I realised that um, I, I just hadn't wanted to even accept that my parents had created... Uh, you know, I wasn't thinking about school or anything then. But, um, yeah, so I feel like that's really prevented me from growing and processing through emotions yeah see see the only way we can actually be become more open to god is by processing through emotions that prevent us from becoming more open to yeah. god and if if our feelings are that if i process through my emotions towards god and finish up not having any towards god then i'll do a whole heap of things that will make other people upset and angry and mm. um, then you can see there's an imperative to not do it yeah. And this is what many of us are living in. We're living, we've chosen already. We've yeah. chosen to not do it. And we've chosen to not go ahead with that processing because of what our, because we value the relationships more than we value our relationship with God, mm. basically. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, if we, ah, yes, Joe. Um, just going back to where we were saying how we feel about God is related, how we really feel about our parents. Yep. I've been aware and recognised since my late teens that my parents and other significant caregivers totally failed at looking after me properly. Yep. Which is why I got so good at looking after myself and my younger siblings. Yep. So why do I still associate that with God? You, you've just given yourself the answer in the question. Can you see? No, I'm sorry, you I can't. Right. What you've done is you've substituted parent reliance with self reliance. Yes. Have you not? Yes. So what you've done is you initially when you're a child you're reliant on your parent, right? So you could say you are parent reliant, right? Yeah. And then once you realise uh, that actually that's probably not a good thing because they've harmed you in some ways, yes. right? And not all parents do the same kind of damage as other parents. You know, obviously there's a varying range of things. But once you've realised that. What you do then is you go and transfer all of that into self-reliance. And the beauty of self-reliance, the way you feel is beautiful about self-reliance, mm. is you don't actually have to process anything emotionally. Yes, yeah, yeah. Right. I've well, excused my parents but not forgiven them. 
Correct. You don't have to process anything emotionally because now you're self-reliant and you're just relying on yourself and that's all you need to worry about. And in fact, in that place, we become quite selfish in a lot of ways because yes. we're, we're, we're still not open to love, are we? Because we haven't processed the, through the parent-related stuff. Yeah. We're still not open to God because we're, we're being self-reliant. We, we basically believe now the only person I can trust is me. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's how you feel, big. right? Yeah. The only person I can trust is me. Other people say things to me, do things with me. Sometimes they mean what they say, other times they don't. You know, they're basically all untrustworthy. Yeah. And I agree. The, the, basically, there's not a single person in the entire universe, aside from God, who's ultimately trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And to me, it makes sense because, like, God is the pinnacle. Uh, you know, God's infinite. God knows everything. God has he invented love he invented truth he invented all of these laws it makes sense that it's only that being that's going to be the most trustworthy yes right yeah. and and so I would put to you that even you're not trustworthy for yourself you I see me? that too I fail lots of times too because quite a, not it's not only that you fail you often choose things that are out of harmony with love even towards yourself that God wouldn't choose yes you True. follow True. So, 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 yes, it's not just that you fail or make mistakes. In fact, from God's perspective, you making a mistake, nah, nothing. You know, God doesn't feel anything about you making mistakes. God knows that you don't know everything. You're going to make mistakes. What God is concerned about is the mistakes you make with regard to love and truth. Yes. So I said to the last group um, last week, love and truth are joined by the hip, right? They're Siamese twins. You can't have one without the other. Many of you do believe you can but you can't. And, and, and God's trying to teach you these basic truths, right? So many, many times you're not even truthful with yourself or loving towards yourself, and God would be more so than you would be towards yourself, loving towards yourself. And, and so what we need to come to do is, is come to see is that actually God is the being that has the most love for me, even more love for me than I have for me. Yes, yes. Yeah, and therefore more reliable. To, that's one I have to get from my head into my heart. Well, you know, there's reasons why. One of the reasons why is that when you choose to swap reliances without addressing the emotion, you're not actually addressing your blockages with God. Okay. You follow? Yep. Yep. Because yep. your blockages with God are all to do with your mm. desire to avoid being reliant on anybody else now. To avoid trusting anybody else, yes. to avoid letting your heart be open to anybody else, because your parents, through their actions towards you, closed your heart and closed your feelings of trust and closed your feelings of faith, closed your feeling these kind of feelings, all of which you're going to need if you connect with God. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so you yes, do have to go through the emotional process with your parents, otherwise. Mm you're going to continue to impose these particular feelings on God anyway. Okay, mm. yep. Thank you. Yep. Graham. Um, I feel like there's something outside of myself that loves me and cares for me, helps me and um, gives me guidance. Um, and it's always proven itself to be really trustworthy and yet I still can't trust it. Yeah, I, I believe you have huge issues with trust, actually. Yeah. Um, same answer as what I just gave Joanne, really, Graham. In that in the, there's been an unwillingness. You've, you have swapped self-reliance with... Like, reliance on others with reliance on self. Y you are the only person you trust. And, and may I point out to you, that's pretty illogical because actually a lot of times you're untrustworthy in your own treatment of yourself, right? But, but, but you are the only person you've come to trust, but you need to, you, you need to deconstruct the reason why, which is related to parent-based events, and you're very resistive to facing up to parent-based emotional events. And, and you have a layer on top, which most of the people in the audience do have, and that is you, you, you have a whole set of addictions that, that are now in play, that prevent you from actually feeling about these particular emotions, right? And, and so when we do our next session, which is all about addictions and facade and things like that, our one in May, and a lot of that 
will apply to yourself as well and to most people in the audience. But, but our addictions help us avoid the emotion that we have here. Right? And this is what many of you are not seeing, is that while you continue to engage your addictions, all you're doing is running around avoiding a whole set of emotions and then wondering why trust won't happen. Right? So, so what I've noticed for yourself, Graham, yeah, is, that, is that somebody can be uh, loving and caring with you in their interactions with you for years and yet you still don't really trust them. Yep. And this is the projection you have at God as well. You don't really trust God. Yep. But, but this is related to, again, parent-based injuries that you're unwilling to emotionally experience. I feel like, I'm not sure to what extent this is thinking and what extent it's feeling. Yep. But, uh, like, um, <coughs> I was a pretty sensitive child and it's almost like I was told that what I was feeling, you know, like, if somebody says they love me and I feel something completely different, you were taught not to trust that. I was taught not to trust my own feelings. You were. Um, and that's, it's like I have this enormous disappointment with um, everybody else because it's... I believed that what was outside me was truth and what was inside me wasn't. And yeah. I let it go. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I think that's where the trust issues come from because... I think, I think, though, you're just guessing where they're coming from at this point. Maybe. Yeah, because, it, because you're using your intellect now to analyse where it came from rather than just feeling how you don't trust anybody. So my suggestion to you is to just go into that feeling, allow yourself to feel that you don't trust anybody, God included. You don't, you don't, as you know, you've got guidance as well. The, the person you've referred to is not God but a guide and, and who does love you and care about you right you've felt their presence most of your life and yet you still don't really trust them either um, so so it is a big issue for you in fact i feel it's your primary issue with god if you can work through that particular issue then you'll be a lot more open to entering this relationship with god where you want to discover god you know want to know what god's true nature and personality actually is at this stage you believe god is just another untrustworthy person So remove the addictions. Once you remove them, these emotions will be exposed. Then it's your willingness to process those emotions which is going to determine the outcome. Can you give me a little pointer to the addictions? Um, <clears throat> yes, one addiction you have is you constantly want reassurance from people about what they're saying and doing. Um, if you analyse all of our interactions even, you do that with me all the time. Even though you've had years of proof that I'm probably going to be consistent, um, you still believe the next time round you're still confused about how I'm treating you, even though it's consistent with the last times. And, and this, is a, this is an indication that you, you're addicted to doubting people. You want to doubt them because it's your protective shield. You follow me? Even though a person might have proven themselves to be more consistent, you're, it's your protective shield. And so, so I would examine your addiction to doubt. Does that make sense? Yeah. There's a, you have a strong desire to maintain doubt so that action and a change inside of yourself doesn't have to take place. So that's an example of one of the addictions that affect your issues of trust. Thank you. Yep. Okay. If we come down, just... Uh, uh, yeah, 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 Bob. Sorry, Bob. I know I have blocks towards God, but yeah. there are times when I can get into prayer and feel like I can connect. <coughs> but is that just spirits? That's one of my fears now. Am I just connecting with spirits trying to make me feel good, meet my addiction? My dear sister, um, the USA has major problems with addictions, <laughs> as you know. Yeah. And one of, one of these addictions is, is that they sort of, they don't, 
Most people who pray, who pray, even on the planet really, who pray, really just want God to come to their party type of thing, want God to do what they want them to do. Mm -hmm. You follow me? Yes. And in those moments when you have that feeling, yes, you're certainly just receiving spirit, feelings from spirits. You've had occasional moments where you've processed through something emotionally, as you know, mm -hmm. and, and you've, at those times when you've been freaked out, processing through something emotionally that's when you've had a small connection with God but those times feel very much more unpleasant for you emotionally right yes and because of that you don't allow them to happen very long yep. okay. so so what I'm suggesting to you is yes sometimes you are connecting to spirits just to get sort of certain addictive mm -hmm. things met and then other times when you actually do process a sincere emotion you're actually connecting to God and the important thing for you is to know when those two events are occurring yes. right don't cause one event the connection with spirits to interfere with the fact that there are other times when you actually do connect to God you need to experiment with this process as to what's going on. Okay. Does that Thank make sense? You. And yes. not be so afraid of making a mistake about it. Uh, yeah, that's one of my big things. I'm always afraid of being wrong. Yeah, one of the emotions I felt from you as a group last night was this terrible barrage of fear. You know, like okay. you're so afraid of what is even going to come out of my mouth half the time. I don't know whether I can speak. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And, and you don't need to be this afraid. Learn, you're, you're lear, learners. It's like a person who's learning to drive or something. Absorb information. Allow your heart to be open to the absorption of information. Uh, Honour the fact that you're a learner. And, and God doesn't expect you to know everything. In fact, God knows that you will never know everything. So, so it's only this connection between worth and knowledge that is the big problem for most of us. That's why we enter so much fear. Because we're afraid to feel how un unworthy we feel when we don't know. So, so you need to break that relationship up as well. The relationship between knowledge and worth. And again, that is a childhood process through childhood experiences. Yes. Right? Our yes. knowledge, our worth connected to what we know because of how we were brought up and how we were trained and how we were taught at school. Yes. All, all, those, all those things occurred. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's come down to Dharma. Thanks. By the way, can I just mention, when you're in this line um, up there like that, uh, you can see where Corny is, you can see where he's holding his hands. When you're in that line, you're going to have to stand up because he can't see, get you properly in the shot. You follow me? If you choose to s sit in that line between the cameras and where Lena is through to the back from where Corny is, he, he won't be able to see you. So can you please, in future, those of you in that area, automatically just stand up. Thanks. Dharma, thanks. I have two questions. Yep. One is when you drew the three circle, avoiding something, reason for avoiding emotions and feelings towards God, and you say to look at the reasons first. Yep. How young can you be when you come up with reasons for avoiding or is it something you do a little bit older all of your reasons for avoiding all come from experiences in your childhood okay you understand mm -hmm. and 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 these experiences taught you to deny certain things and accept other things okay your father so so what you're going to have to do is revisit these experiences emotionally because they're stored within you so that means having an allowance of revisiting experiences from your childhood that will help you process through the reasons. So remember when we drew the three circles, we had these feelings about God, which are not really feelings about God. And then over here we had the actual, the actual feelings we're avoiding. right? And we have reasons for avoiding those feelings. Yes. Right? So what I'm suggesting to you is these reasons that we have for avoiding the feelings are based upon childhood experiences, what happened to us when we felt something. So, so to give you an example, let's say, um, let's say I, I felt hurt by somebody emotionally, and so I start crying. And my, my, my dad comes up and gruffly says to me, what are you crying about? You don't have to cry about that. 
Well, there's, there's one of my reasons being created. Okay. To avoid crying. Okay. The fact that I'll receive my father's disapproval if I cry. Okay. Does that so make sense? You can be very young. So you can be very young when that happens, right? So, so, so the, there are reasons that are created emotionally, and then there are the avoidance. Now, now usually, one thing that can help if your mum and dad are still on the earth and you still interact with them, you can examine what they avoid yes. and even look at the reasons they avoid it, okay. because it's highly likely those reasons are in you. You follow? Okay. So that can help you a lot in terms of okay. seeing the relationship. Thank you. You had a second question. Yes. Um, so uh, people who were disappointed with parent reliant and became self reliant. Yep. You mentioned that they end up becoming selfish because the only person they can trust is themselves. Yes. I didn't understand how. Why would that make me selfish? There is an automatic belief inside of us in that state. You leave the mic with you because you might want to ask for things. There's an automatic belief in that state that, that my own opinions and my own um, decisions are always right and other people are probably going to be wrong. And there's, a, there's a, also a belief in that state that I can only trust my own opinions and I can't trust anything else externally. Now in that state, you're not very sensitive to the opinions or the feelings of others automatically because you're in a self-reliant state. You're only focused on your own life. And this is what's happened on the planet a lot, is that we see whole like people, you know, many of you in the audience are living this way. You remember, have all of you listened to the channelings that, that Mary and I did before the group? You remember Greg, who lived in a lone life? You remember him? And he, he was a person who... who is it wrong name? Glenn, sorry, yes, Glenn, who, who, was, uh, um, who, who was living his own life, you know, doing his own thing, not, not being involved with women because he had emotions with women, he, he wanted to protect himself. Now, because he wanted to protect himself, he was very self-reliant. As a result, he knew very little of what was happening on the planet and, and, and how he could impact it positively. He was only involved in having what he believed was a happy life. Now, that's selfishness. Right? A person, a person who is, who's self-reliant becomes selfish naturally as a part of the process because all you're considering is your own feelings that you have to avoid or your own feelings that you need to enjoy, your own addictions most of the time that you need to enjoy. That's all you're really considering and analysing. You don't care very much about the rest of the world in that state. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. So, so this is why the majority of us don't care that there's 100 million children dying every year. It never even crosses our mind. And yet when an event, if it, like if an event here happened tomorrow where something locally got blown up by a terrorist, you'd be talking about it for days. Right? And yet there's only a few deaths from that in comparison to the other event. Now why is that? It's because we've become so selfishly oriented that we are only concerned for our own fear. That's all we're doing. We're not considering anything else other than our own fear in most of our analysis of events and situations. Right? And that's why we can just, like Blinkered, cut off 100 million deaths a year without any consideration of what we're doing. It's, it's a serious problem, actually. Yeah. And, and it all comes from this self-reliant condition in the end. Yep. If we go, oh, Tara, so then we go on this side, if we can go across to Alex on this side. Um, <clears throat> I'm finding this, that I'm constantly judging love, judging what's loving, particularly when it comes to the children. So I'm always in my head judging, this is not loving, that's loving, this is not loving, that's loving, and it's very tiring. Because mm, the reason why you do that is you don't know what's loving. No. You'd be better off just admitting to yourself that you don't know. So is it just to avoid being wrong? And that's feeling scared of I'm going to get it wrong. Well, Tara, um, in the next few, few days, I'm going to ask you to analyse why 
because you need to do a lot of this analysis for yourself. But, but it, one, that is one of the reasons, but it's one of many mm. reasons. And, and you need to know, obviously, and work your way through all of them. But the primary one that I affects yourself is that you're not willing to feel the emotion of fear. You're just not willing to feel it. And if you're not willing to feel it, you're going to live by it. And this is the penalty of not feeling fear, is that you end up living in it. Is that the fear of making a decision and being like, because I'm yeah. shaking right now. Yeah, you're terrified of, and, you're um, terrified of don't making any decision that might appear wrong. So, um, I don't want to go into a story. When I wake up, at, I wake, get woken up at night. You are like going that, into a story, yeah. With fear. You're, you so have fear in your life and you're in complete <coughs> avoidance of it and, you, and Mary's talked to you about it so many times uh -huh. and you are in complete ignorance of it and you wish to maintain ignorance of it. Mm -hmm. And what you're bearing is the penalty of such a decision. The penalty is that you don't know what's loving. You don't know what to do in any situation. That's part of the penalty. Okay. And then you punish yourself for that. Yeah, I do. Right? But that's an avoidance too, isn't it? Yeah. Because that, that's just another way of getting out of the fact that you've made a choice yeah. with your will to not feel fear. Yeah. Right? So, so at this stage, you have very little understanding of how many of your decisions and choices are all based around the one thing that you do not wish to feel fear. And you are not seeing the results of that choice either. You don't link up the cause, choosing to not feel fear is your cause, and the effect with all of the law of compensatory effects of the choice to not feel fear. Yeah. Uh, many of you ladies are doing this. You, you're, you're frequently avoiding the feeling of fear and then you get a whole heap of negative consequences of that choice and then you blame the consequence. Mm -hmm. when, when actually you should be looking at the fact that you've made a choice to not feel fear. That's the problem you, you're in. Okay. Does that make sense? Thanks. Yep. Now, I'm sorry, my friend, Alex, uh, I'm over time now, so I've really got to stay on track today, otherwise we'll get way out of, out of uh, track. So what I'd like to say to you in summary of this particular section is you can see it's essential not only to analyse how we feel about love, but also to analyse how we feel about the source of love. Can you see that? Because we are not going to receive an education from the source of love while we're blocked to that being. We're not going to. And we need to analyse both. Now, we also need to see, as we've discussed, the association between all of those things that we feel about the source of love are actually nothing to do with our personal experience. They're everything to do with our experience with other people in authority. Right? That's what they have to do with. And while we're unwilling to process through that emotionally, we are going to continue to use this excuse, it's just an excuse, to blame God for things that God has never done. And to blame love for things that love would never do. Right? And many of you are now caught in this cycle, this trap of blaming God for things that God hasn't done and blaming love for things that love would never do. And this is an indication that we've not accepted God's definition of love and that we're not accepting education from the source. So this is something we need to address. Does that make sense? So tomorrow afternoon we're going to give you some homework about that in terms of helping you address that particular subject. So what we're going to do now, it's our 20 minute break. So if we can come back at 2 p.m. it is, isn't it? And if we come back at 2 p.m. and get started to in the afternoon session, there's just two sessions this afternoon. Thank you.